Uncle Mugi, we thank you for welcoming us up us this morning with your smoking ceremony. Your bio is extensive, so I won't read it all out. Of course, over his life, he's become a major central figure in the fabric of contemporary South Australia, both as a representative for First Nations Excellent and a defender of and ambassador for country. He's a leader, he's an artist, his work seamlessly connects performance, culture, people and country. His artwork spans traditional dance and song, cultural advice, arts and craft, such as wood carvings and martial arts techniques using handcrafted traditional shields, clubs, boomerangs and spears. He's had a lifetime of advocating for our people. As we heard earlier today, he was awarded an Order of Australia medal in 2014, the South Australian's Premier's NAIDOC Award just last year, um, and he was recently awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award in the South Australian Environment Awards for his dedication for caring not only the country, but the people of South Australia. Please welcome Uncle Mugi Sumner. And joining him on stage is uh, Thomas Mayer. Thomas is a Kararug Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander man. He's a union official with the MUA and is an advocate in the campaign for a constitutionally enshrined voice, which is one of the key aspects of the Uluru Statement. He's also an author of four books and he's published articles and essays in The Guardian, The Griffith Review and The Sydney Morning Herald. Please welcome Thomas Mayer. And we've saved the best till last. <laughs> Sally Scales is a Pidjantjara woman from the far west of the APY lands, Anangu, Pidjantjara, Yunkinjara lands in remote South Australia. I've been practicing that for a week. <laughs> now, Sally, has, Sally has worked at the APY Art Centre Collective since 2013 in cultural liaison, elder support and spokesperson roles. Um, she, is part, she was part of the youth leadership team for the Uluru Statement Reform, having been involved in the Referendum Council's constitutional regional dialogues in Ross River, Adelaide and at the National Convention in 2017. Um, and since then, she's been involved in the Uluru Dialogue Leadership. Please welcome Sally Scales. Yeah. So th thanks, thanks for joining us. And this is Fluid, so don't wait for me to ask a question. You can jump in. Um, and I'll take it as a comment if we need to. Let's, let's, let's talk about, I want to talk about the overall statement of the heart. So there were three elements of the Uluru Statement from 2017. But to do that, I want to start at the very beginning. There's, as long as First Nations people have been asking for a voice, for a say in our own affairs, there's been a crossover between art, culture and politics. We go back to the original... Uh, petitions of the 1930s by William Cooper, we go to the Yurikala Bark petitions, we go to the Barunga Statement, you know, the Redford Statement, that art, culture, politics, having a say in our own affairs has collided. How is that continued through the statement of the heart in its entirety? I'll start with you, Sally. I mean, the clear thing looking at the three different um, statements that you just talked about, the Yurikala um, statement and the Barunga statement and then the Uluru statement was that it is very much their political statements and they've got these incredible cultural significant paintings that surround it. That it's not just a painting though, this is what we forget or what the Western art contemporary space tells us that it's a pretty painting. No, 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 no. <laughs> That's got Jukurpa and when I talk about Jukurpa and I I don't like the word dream time or dreaming because I feel like that's a deeply insignificant word for our connection to culture, our connection to our sacred songs, our connection to each other. And so those paintings that we see, that jukurpa, that law and culture, that rights and responsibilities that it has to those sacred sites and to those families that look after that, you know, when you people say and dismiss it and say, oh, that's a really pretty sort of artwork. No, 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 that's a cultural work that is talking about that country 
and it tells us. And when you look at those Yukala Bark petitions and and I'm very I'm not meaning to be disrespectful, this is just me being cheeky. Um, when I look at that hall in Canberra, which I nicknamed the Dead Hall of Dead Treaties, because those beautiful uh, petitions were given there and they put it up in a white institution and they cry over it and they look at it and go, oh my God, I wish I did something more. I was like, Ugh, I don't need your tears, I need your backbone. Um, and so when you look at that and that those culturally significant statements, so when it came to Uluru, and so the women of Murijulu weren't there. And so we wanted them to put their imprint onto it. And so they did the Jukupa of Uluru on that so that you can read it in two ways. Sammy Wilson, the TO of Murijulu community who gave the name for us to use in the Uluru statement, says that you read that statement two ways. You've got the English version, version written in, in English and then you've got the Anangu version which is written on the sides. So that's really integral. So our art and culture has never disappeared. It's very much entwined to our politics. It's very much entwined to our activism. It's very much entwined to who we are as a people. And it goes back to that Jukupa is that connection of my land is me and I am my land. Thomas, I'll get your thoughts. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and Sally talking about how it moves people, you know, and, uh, you know, people see these artworks uh, that are political statements and they move to tears by it. That in itself uh, is a powerful thing in the way that each of those statements and petitions have, have uh, culminated in the Uluru Statement. They've moved people progressively over the years. And we're at a point now where the Uluru Statement itself when people see that canvas, you know, because it's more than just a picture, it's it's a it's a canvas, it's a sacred object um, that has basically moved the entire nation to a point next year where we're going to have a referendum and we can finally see our voices acknowledged and respect respected in a guaranteed way, and that's in the constitution. Um, so artwork is something that importantly moves. Um, you know, an entire population to listen to us. And I think that's uh, an important part of it. Yeah. Uncle Morgan, we heard uh, Minister Burke this morning talk about art and culture being central to everything we do. And he spoke about First Nations first. We heard uh, during Pat Anderson's uh, keynote the same, that art and culture is central to everything we do. What are your thoughts on art and culture being central to everything that we do as First Nations people? And how do we make sure that that is brought to the forefront and brought to the attention of the wider Australian community? What are you talking about? Uh... Just give me your mic, Sal. You're talking about art and culture being central, we talk about the creation stories, all the stories that connect to every one of us, every group in this country. You can paint them. You paint them on the ground. I've seen paintings done that you'd never seen in your life done in sand. When they finish telling the story about that, they'll dance all over that to dance it back into the earth, dance it back into Mother Earth. That connects us in our stories to this country that we stand on. That connects us to the stars, because some of them stories are about the stars too. All the stuff that, that people talk about in this land, the stories that connect us to the law. When people start talking about the law, they talk about creation stories. They talk about the morals of them stories. The punishment. You play up. You know that you're going to get get punished by that story. That story tells you. They put it into paintings. 
people see that and they know the story straight away. So all of these stories, whatever it is that you, about the land, the, and I'm like you, I don't like that word dreaming. It was a, it's a word that was given to our stories that's law. They're not dreaming. We don't dream about them. <laughs> you look at the stars. You look at the, the ocean. You look at the moon. You know, in a lot of, lot of places around the world, they put people away that's got mental problems. And they lock them up. They call them lunatic asylums. Luna comes from the moon. The moon controls all the waters of the world, the tides. Our body's made up of 80 something, 90 something percent water. And it controls us too. And it controls the animals. You see the wolves over in Canada howling at the moon, at the full moon. It's controlling them too. Same as the earth controls us. Over the last 10, 15 something years, I've been doing ceremonies down the river, dancing, looking at how we heal our waters, looking at how we heal the land, looking after the animals, the fish, talking about them. All of that is about what we have to look at with the Uluru Statement. You've got people saying, well, we have to talk about this. We've got a voice. We've got treaty. We've got truth. You start telling the truth. You don't have to tell any more lies. Because if you tell a lie once, you'll have to tell another lie to back that lie up. Later on down the track, you'll forget about all the lies you told in the first place, and then you'll start telling them again. So why not just tell the truth straight out, and then that way... But also looking after this, this planet, every person around the world, not just us, everyone else. We could be doing the best we can here. Someone else is planning something else over there. So we have to all start talking. Otherwise, we're going to finish up with space junk. We've got nowhere else to go once we stuff this place up. Mm-hmm. So, you got I've got little kids playing, doing the, the creation stories. They're doing b- dances about the birds, how the birds have had an argument, and then, then it's all about, the story at the end of it is about lies and cheating. I've got a little girl. She's narrating the story. I get her to read the story out, and all the kids play all different birds, paint it up differently. This is in the schools. I'm teaching them now in the schools the stories about how we look after ourselves, but how we look after the land too. Mm. So that's, that's where, where I'd, I'd like to, to uh, get people going and talk about and doing stuff and dancing and, and all the other stuff is, you know, once you start that, we keep our stories going like our elders sat down and told us, I'm doing the same thing now. I don't realize it, but I'm, I'm one of the elders too now. Mm. See, and I, I tell the stories to all the young kids. And like I said here this morning, I've got, I got a lot of children, grandchildren to tell the story to, but they grew up dancing, listening to the stories. They grew up making all the stuff and doing all and looking after the trees and animals and that. With the Ngarinjari, he got the word Ngachi. Ngachi means my best friend. Now, we've got animals that are our best friends. We look after them. We don't hunt them. We don't eat them. That's a way of looking after and making sure that that animal goes on and on and on. Mm. So that, that's, that's what I... Yeah, stories, stories about country. Yeah. Yeah, and Uncle Mungli touched on that element of the makarata, so from the voice, the makarata, and that truth-telling, and I always look at it as like, I want our stories to be told through our lenses, not through middle-aged, and I don't know if there's any in the room, middle-aged white men. 
Because how many years and years have we listened to them take our stories, take our recordings, take our song lines, take our family lineages, our, um, you know, the, our mapping systems, all of that, and use it for their own gain. You know, they get their doctorate, they get their professorship, they have their book deals, but it's all of our stuff. It's all our information. And let's be honest, half the time they get it wrong, you know. So I can't wait for us to tell our stories. And as Mugi's saying, he's teaching these young ones now to look after country through that, through their inma, through their dancing, through that singing. So that's what is exciting for this, is that more and more there is a greater understanding and need by the wider Australian public to let us tell our stories. Let us be in control of those stories, not through a lens of someone else saying that, not through the spatterings that we used to get at in schools. Uh, you know, it's the sprinkling of um, Aboriginal weeks that we used to get at school. You know, we only have it at Reconciliation Week and we only have it at NAIDOC Week. We don't really talk about Aboriginal other times. So, you know, I would love to see it more embedded and that goes through our law and culture and it's not just during the Black Weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas? Yeah, spot on, Sally and, and Uncle Moogie. The um, truth-telling needs a voice, right? I mean, I think, I think most of the politicians already know the truth. They've got the Royal Commission reports. They've got all the, you know, they, they hear from the mob that are working in the art space about, you know, um, intellectual property and, and protecting it from the carpet. But bags Thomas, and all they that. only read the top sheet. They don't That's read the full report. <laughs> <laughs> and they've seen the recommendations. They know the truth, but they don't act. And so what's missing is giving the truth our voice in a way that they cannot ignore. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about that aspect of it, because it relates to truth-telling, in that we need political power to be able to see the truth result in outcomes. Um, I, I want to talk about the Uluru Dialogue and the summit and maybe some of the regional dialogues. Back in the early 90s, that's it, after the uh, native title uh, Mabo decision, was tasked with really coming up with a social justice package. So they undertook uh, a widespread national consultation process um, and came up with a report called Recognition, Rights and Reform. And some people in the room may have helped contribute to that. And that looked at all the different aspects of Aboriginal Australia, in Torres Strait Islander Australia, from intellectual property, law and justice, to treaty, to constitutional recognition, to national days, everything, health reforms, etc. At Uluru and in the regional summits, did you guys look at that or was it more overarching that we don't want to get bogged down in the specific aspects that we all talk about and want change in? We want major structural reform and this is the way forward. Um, so with the regional dialogues, I forced myself onto two um, because I'm from Central Australia, but I'm in South Australia. So I'm like, well, I'm going to go to Ross River and I'm going to come to Adelaide. Um, and also it's two different things. The Northern Territory doesn't have the protection of a state. Um, I have to say I've never been a part of a dialogue that the mandate for people to come along for it was young people women and men, but making sure that young people and women were a part of it. And they wanted it to, to be 60% uh, of um, invitees were not a part of a community organisation. So just everyday people. And when, so this is what, six, six, six years ago now. Um, and it's pretty crazy to think about the fact that that was the mandate for those dialogues. That you had to be a community, it was community mob, all of it. If you were part of a board or, you know, um, land council, all that sort of stuff, you had to be a part of that 40% sort of thing. Um, but they really wanted to have young people there. They really wanted to make sure women were involved in it because we get forgotten in those consultation processes. Um, and it was pretty amazing to have that. And at Ross River, they had 
everyone was invited to speak in their own languages and so they had about four no they had six they had six translators on hand for all the central desert languages and we talked about the race clause we talked about treaty we talked about whether we wanted the recognize sort of mandate which was let's just put it in and say we recognize that aboriginal people were here and that was a big fat no from everybody um <laughs> that's why recognize fell down um and then there was one more that I didn't go along to, but it was just they had five options for people to go and talk about. But there was a long, lengthy conversation around constitutional reform and all that history as well. Mm. So it was really getting straight into the structural reform which is needed. Yeah, well, what the options are. What did we want? So it was giving everyone the option and then breaking out in groups about what was the best, like, so people could go and listen to all the different conversations and think about which one they preferred, um, you know. And so, as I said, no one wanted the recognised sort of, let's just stamp it on the front saying that we acknowledge that mm. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were here. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it was based on the, th that work that had been done, you know, so many pieces of work, um, the expert panel, you know, previous joint select committees, uh, other reports... Uh, and um, and there was also a film I should say that um, that Rachel Perkins narrated and put together. It went f it went through the history of our struggle, you know. So this history that we have uh, as First Nations people in our struggle for rights and self determination and recognition of other statements and petitions of the representative bodies that we've established in the past, you know, from the 1920s, the Australian Aboriginal Progressive Association, um, you know, the NAC, as you mentioned, Bola, um, the NACC for CATSI, um, all of these all of these times where, where we've established uh, a voice to use the truth to get outcomes that have made governments uncomfortable and that they've silenced, you know. And so that was a really important film that all of the participants saw. Um, so that we could learn the lessons from the past. Mm. Uncle Mary, I want to talk about truth-telling. So the, the three elements of the Uluru Statement in its entirety are voice, treaty and truth. Um, and I want to talk about truth-telling. Um, and in Pat Anderson's address this morning, she, she spoke about really a failure of our nation, that the stories of our past, really the, the national narrative is quite thin. How do you see the Uluru Statement in its entirety, changing the national narrative to really bringing around the truth of this country's history. Well, truth telling is that what it says. Just tell the truth. Don't go trying to build a big wall around what you're going to say. Just tell the truth, and. We all know what the truth is and we all know what lies is. So if you're going to tell the truth, tell the truth. If you don't know it, there's enough books out there that's been written by non-Aboriginal people. Mm -hmm. yeah? You go and read some of them, you'll find out. Yeah. You know, you look at Blood on the Wattle. You ever, you ever read that book? It was, it was written by Station owners, police, families going out for their picnics on the weekend. They wrote their little report of what they'd done on the weekend. They had a good time. Mm -hmm. They went and had a picnic. Entertainment was shoot a couple of elbows. That's all there. You read it. This was, these books were written even before we, we could, half of us could speak English or understand English writing. You can buy that book anywhere now. Blood on the Wattle. I think they've got them in the museums around. <laughs> no, <I'm not> <laughs> <laughs> I don't need any more money. <laughs> I'll ask them to donate a, so, donate a book to everyone. <laughs> Uncle, 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 what has this country got to fear about the true history of this country? What has this country got to fear? Well, you look at all the money it's making from mining. All the money they make from different lands. You know, in, in my part of the country where I was born, my mum's from here and my dad's from the Kurung. 
along Lake Alexandrina and the River mm. Murray, the Korang. They had ration houses. Mm. You put the rations there, they got everyone. It was like, you might not say it was like a drug house mm. to understand it more. Mm. They got used to eating sugar. They got used to eating meat and all the other vegetables that it wasn't, they never tried before. When they got used to it, they moved the ration house further away. So everyone followed that ration house and they camped there. When they followed it and camped there, the government went in and built fences around, that, around all that land and they sold it to farmers. And my people was told, you go back there and you get shot. People went back there, yes, yeah, sure enough, they were right, they got shot. So they moved away. And when they got used to the ration house there, they moved it again. And they followed them. They followed this, the food, the free meat. You don't have to hunt anymore, we'll feed you. That's what they were told. So they just sat around doing nothing, waiting for the beef or lamb. They got used to that. You went to school. You start speaking your language in school then, you had a good flogging. When I was going to school, you were forced to go to do different classes. You are forced to go to church. Your culture was taken away from you. So when you're looking at the truth about things, tell the truth about that. Tell the truth about how, how it was done. Mm. You got, you know, I, I, you know Uncle David Yanipen on the $50 note? He's from my community. I remember him as a, as a boy and then I he passed away when I was about 15, I think. Last week, uh, a week, two weeks ago, I went to Sydney and uh, spoke at the Sydney University about him, about these little boomerangs that he made. And he put them together and he spun them. And when he spun them, they lifted. Two people from Germany seen that and asked if they could have a look at it. So he let them have a look at it. Next day, he come back and he went and answered for them. They said, oh no, we lost it. So he couldn't make a fuss about it because at that time Aboriginal people didn't have any rights whatsoever. So, and this was in 1914. After that, the Germans put a helicopter. They were the first people to make the helicopter from them little boomerangs. They developed these big, big ones. At the university in Sydney now, they're building drones with these little boomerangs that they scanned and shrunk down to size. They make two of them and put them on four corners of, the, of that drone. And sure enough, they're flying. And yet, no Aboriginal or Aboriginal family has got one cent out of that. You're looking at, you know, looking at ideas and things that we've been doing. They're calling, they're calling this video now. It'll be out on Channel 10 next year. The first inventors. So watch it. It's on. I'm in it. Then I'm throwing boomerangs and spears, talking about the aerodynamics of the boomerang. Yeah. We do our own stuff so that when people say that they're telling it about them, they're not telling it about them. They're telling lies. Tell me all the books. Like you said, a lot of them books are lies. Yeah, that, uh, that series, The First Inventors, is a, yeah. a collaboration between Channel 10 and NITV, yeah. um, narrated by, narrated uh, by uh, uh, Robert Pons. Uh, 
<laughs> can 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 I product placement? Well, anyone? Yeah, product placement. The nominations are coming up soon, everyone. Can I just can I just chuck something in yeah, there? You... The follow that one of the one of the follows that's there. He I taught him how to make the boomerang, so he made one, and I taught him how to throw it. And there we are, nice, nice big boomerang like that. And before he, when he threw it the first time, I said, now when you throw it, as soon as it leaves your hand, I said, keep your eye on it. But he said, it looks exactly like yours. I said, yeah. I said, it is exactly like mine. So I, I threw mine, and sure enough, come back. I said, now your shot. I said, but keep your eye on it. He said, yeah, okay. He threw it. What do you think he done when he threw it? He started talking to the cameraman. <laughs> it come back and boom. <laughs> Knocked him down. I said, hey, you just threw a weapon there that could kill you. <laughs> he said, oh, I'm sorry. I said, hey, say sorry to the boomerang, not me. <laughs> but things like that, that'll be, I hope they caught that on video <laughs> and put that on in our TV. <laughs> but... Uh, Things like that. You just tell the truth about anything. I mean, it, the you asked about the uncomfortability, right? Or what is going to be that change? Australia has a history that it has not really recognised. Let's be honest about that. You know, they look at our history in a way, weird way. They d never really want to acknowledge it. You know, it was so hard for them to even say sorry you know, for the stolen generation. But we all know more children have been removed since then than the time before. So our history is so important to tell for this country to heal and that's the uncomfortable thing that they have to go through. That's the reckoning that needs to happen through those conversations. And in the art space as well, so for me as an artist, I no longer talk about my jukuba. I don't talk about what I've painted because I think that is such a Western anthropological museum thing to say this boomerang, using your thing, was made by so-and-so when it goes through that whole person's history when for a white person they just say this is that one's work. Whereas we have to explain on a different level our paintings, our stuff, which is already such an important part of us, that is a piece of us, and then we have to explain more. So I've stopped telling my paintings. So for that, it just sits in that space of you can see it and feel it for yourself rather than me having to retell you. Because also there's so much information out there. But it's allowing... In the, in the art space, I want us to be in the room in every single white institution. I want there to be Aboriginal artists in every single room. Not just these European Queen Elizabeth rooms. Let's take some of them off and put some of our queens and kings in there and have them in every space. I don't want us to be in a room that is just the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander wing. Because we're not a wing, we're in every space. And that's the uncomfortability that these, in these cultural institutions need to have a reckoning with. So that, that's a great comment. And that's part of what I think <coughs> the minister was saying today, First Nations first, right? If that's central and you get that right at the start. Oh, so you all heard that, we all need to make sure that he does is it now. Foundation, uh, is built on that foundation. <coughs> Thomas, I want to get continue the truth telling. Um, it, it's one of the main aspects of the Uluru Statement um, and it will be an uncomfortable conversation with the Australian nation and in fact there is strong resistance already to just initial changes or corrections of history. The recent comments by a netballer about a mining magnate that were made 40 years ago when people dismissed those as that was 1984. We don't have to worry about those. Um, so there was national dialogue about that. The Koori Mail today uh, had an editorial where they were talking about um, the budget and they said that $6 million to start a truth-telling process for the people of today to rewrite our historical past. 
So even in our national media, there's this sense of we're not telling the truth, we're actually rewriting history. So I suppose what role do you see First Nations art and culture playing in the truth-telling space of the Uluru Statement? Yeah, well, our art and culture, and I'm not an artist, you know, <laughs> um, but our I'm just a wolfie, um, but our art and culture has already done so much to, so much truth-telling already, you know, like it's, uh, I think the um, reconciliation barometer says that it's something like 90%, over 90% of Australians, uh, you know, realise that, 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 that something has to be done in this space. And I think the art and culture, um, you know, all you people that have done such, um, you know, a massive amount of work in this space um, have done that truth-telling to the nation for a very long time and is putting us in good stead where the sentiment of the Australian people is with us and for change. Um, and that can only get better when we have a voice in the centre of decision-making about all of these things. Mm. Uh, got, Uncle Miguel, I'll ask you first. <clears throat> can we wait any longer? Can this nation wait any longer? We heard uh, Bob Weatherall's uh, keynote this morning, a sense of frustration about, you know, he's still arguing about the same things that he was standing outside the, the British Museum or the Manchester Museum wanting human remains, not art and objects, our people, our ancestors returned. It took 11 years, Bob, for those things to be returned. There's a sense of still a sense of frustration with people that have been in this for a long time. Can we wait any longer as a nation for truth telling? No. And with Bob, I've travelled overseas a lot of times with him, went to the museums, sat down, talked, negotiated with board members and different people. And I just spoke to him this morning about, I said, do you still remember what was said to you when we sat around this big table all oh, about long, the length of this? And we sat there talking. And I was sitting like here. Bob was there. Uh, no, Bob was here. And then there was, there was, there was a fellow named Rodney Dillon. And this little fellow from the museum was here, and every now and again, he was talking, <laughs> every now and again. This is the Museum of Natural History, and right in the middle of London. And this fellow would talk, and next minute he'd look around me, and he'd look at Bob. And never say anything, and then talking away, and it kept talking. And then he'd look at Bob again. I don't know what Bob, but you might, might have took a fancy to Bob or not, I don't know. <laughs> but kept going like that, and then he'd look at Bob. <laughs> and then he looked at Bob and said, Bob, when you die, can you donate your body to, to the museum? No. Isn't that right, Bob? Uh. So Bob grabbed him, <laughs> rug him, <laughs> drug him around me. I was sitting here and nearly getting knocked off my chair. Grabbed him and swung him out on the table. That little, little fellow was spinning on the table. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he... I thought he got... I, I know the answer was no from Bob. <laughs> So we've been waiting a long time. I've, I just got back from from uh, Washington D.C. Bought some remains back, and there was a, the the Ngarangiri, the Ghana, Naranga, and some T.I. people. We bought back from from uh, the Smithsonian Museum. Got back home here, and then got a call and said there's some more there. They, they discovered that they had about five full-bodied remains. Skin. I might... It's the, it's oh, the man from the museum, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> there's Bob still there. <laughs> he want he want you, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I got a call from, from Canberra saying there's 
there's five, four or five remains, plus there's one 15-year-old girl there. Her remains are still there too. She's a Ngarangiri girl, and the four men, they're Ngarangiri. And the young girl was traded back in 1926 for the remains of a Native American from the South Australian Museum here. So, doing all this, and in London, the city of London and the museums there, a friend of mine, he used to be working at the Manchester Museum, he done a count and went around and counted different uh, records and that that's in all the museums around London, and there's about 70-something thousand in, in London. Aboriginal remains, and they're all sitting in boxes. Germany's got a lot. Every museum around the world has got remains of our people. So we want to, like Bob, we want to start training other people. We want to get people to come with us, men, women, and youth to come with us so that they learn. Either that or make just one big sweep, bring them all on. And have a place where we can where we can where we can bury them, put them rebury them, put them back because a lot of them, you know, they've they've already had their burials. Yeah. So all of that is why we can't wait any longer. Mm. Why we we have to stand up for our rights. You know, I, I when I was in 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 Washington D.C. I was painted up like I'd painted up this morning, walking around the museum, done the smoking ceremony there, and then we went to the look at the uh, White House. And I walked up to the White House near the fence and looking in, and next minute I see all these fellows standing on the top of the White House. They're all looking down. When I looked at them, they all had binoculars, and they were all looking at me. <laughs> They had all these big guns on them, you know, and next minute, all these dogs and these security guards, they all come along the fence and they all stood around me. I was painted up with these boomerangs. I just said, I only got boomerangs. Look what you fellas got up there. <laughs> all these big guns, you know. So a lot of the stuff that's happening is to show their force. We need to get something in place, go and negotiate, but we negotiate ourselves. Yeah. We go over there, we do this, we go there, talk to these people, talk to them, and say, you know, they're our people. Yeah. We want to take them home. Yeah. Bring them home, not just put them in another place, like you were saying, put another stuff in other places. Take them home, on, to, on country. You know, they spent, some of them, over, over well over 100 years in cardboard boxes down in the basements. Because mm -hmm. I walked down there, I've seen them. I've seen all the stuff they got there in drawers. They've got rooms bigger than this here. With all little drawers, all the boomerangs you've got in there, mm -hmm. from everywhere. All the other artifacts and that, that's all in there. So, you know, we, we need, to, need to get all of that back. It's time, yeah. You know, I offered to say, because I, I, I'm a carver, I offered them, I said, to the Brighton Museum in, in uh, England. I said, I'll come over here, bring the wood, do some new ones for you, and I'll take the old ones home. So they agreed to it, yeah, because it would make money for them. They come in there and watch an Aboriginal carver club. Yeah, so... Yeah, we no, need listen. to. We need exactly what Bob yeah. said. Yes. No, we can't wait any longer. Thomas. Yeah, listening to Uncle Moogie and Uncle Bob, Bob earlier, um, it made me think. Uh, Atsic was doing a whole lot of good work on repatriation of our our people and our our objects, our sacred objects, uh, back when that existed. I think. Um, when when these voices voices that we've established before they've been silenced, um, it's been for. You know, well, John Howard, for example, right? I mean, he didn't want us doing that work. Um, he had a, a, an ideological position ag uh, against us. 
um, sharing uh, what the reality is, what the truth is of this nation and all of those things. He didn't want us to continue the work of building a national treaty, which was part of what ATSIC was doing back then. And so when he silenced that voice, um, he was trying to, he was purposely trying to stop us from making any progress at all. Um, the, this, um, I think this, this work that um, Uncle Bob and Uncle Moogie is talking about is something that should be, you know, it is time, you know, and if we had that, um, that uh, you know, a, a national body that could campaign for that effectively, it shouldn't cost our communities to do that work, you know. There's a whole lot of stolen wealth uh, that should be going into our voice and our, and our, um, our efforts to right those wrongs and bring those um, people back to country where they should be. And just one last thing, you, you mentioned before, Sister Girl there, Wallam, um, and that was a very powerful piece of truth telling and Gina Reinhardt should be ashamed of herself for not, um, you know, for not admitting that what her father was it, you know, yeah. said was absolutely wrong. Um, yeah, good on her and Look, that's took, the sort of truth telling we need to. It took our national media about half a week to actually call those comments racist or controversial, like they were just comments said in 1984. And it's interesting, I don't know if anyone's ever watched that documentary called, um, oh, I forget what it's called, but in that same documentary, Bijoki Peterson made comments three years later about that Aboriginal people shouldn't be given the medicine or be tested for AIDS and HIV, that it was a punishment by God on Aboriginal people. That was in the 1980s. Um, Sally, oh, younger generation, you, you were talking before about the younger generation really contributing uh, to the statement, and you're representing all young people here today. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, <laughs> not just First Nations youth, but do you think that across the board that the younger generation are a lot more engaged and a lot more into change that previous generations have been arguing and debating for for so long? In previous generations, when there's the aspect of truth-telling, and let's tell the truth about this history... Political parties go, well, that's a black arm view of history. We don't want to go there. When we talk about treaties, and treaties have been raised for such a long time, mainstream Australia switches off and go, I'm going to lose something if a treaty. But do you think that the younger generation now are playing a part or will play a part in saying, actually, you guys, the old generation, have been arguing about this for so long. Let's just do it. Uh, for the young people, non-Indigenous young people, yes. I think our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have always been leaders in all the different ways that we've been a part of things. We just haven't been given the opportunity to give our knowledge in a real meaningful way because we've been silenced in different ways. Um, you we look around this room, the incredible leadership that is in here that have done so much work, you know, for you, to, you and Bob to constantly go over it and give your knowledge, your information, your time and effort to do that. Um, definitely that is something we're constantly striving for change and which is what us as young people have picked up on, you know. We are constantly looking at our elders are going, how can I continue what they do and also bring a fresher face to it, I suppose, um, idea. Um, but with the wider Australian public, for sure, the younger generation that is in there, the multicultural communities are really looking at their parents and grandparents and saying, why didn't you guys stand up for anything? Why didn't you guys move? And also looking at the last sort of 30 years, I suppose, where also the last, since that, I call it the, the snake years with Kevin Rudd and Julia and the tic-tac towing they all did about who was the Prime Minister, um, we got complacent. You know, the white Australian people got complacent. We did nothing about the refugees. We did nothing about those detention centres. We've done nothing about the other jails that our kids and young people are in. Um, we've done nothing around climate change. You know, and it's really taken off in the last couple of years where more and more young people are talking up about those issues. Um, and we look at it, you know, from an arts lens, you know, with the Productivity Commission that came out earlier, 
Our arts and culture is one of the biggest exports in this country. There are so many people that buy our arts and crafts. Then you've got that element where there's fake art that is made in Bali and mass produced in China that are using our designs and our aesthetics, which aren't a design. It's not something that we've whipped up on a computer. That's our culture. That's something that has been passed on to us that's in our caves, that is in our songlines. And unfortunately in the Central Australia, we have an unethical space that happens with the carpetbaggers, well, croakly known as carpetbaggers, but it's modern day slavery, which is where they literally kidnap elders of mine and keep them in sheds, make them paint. And they're sold in those commercial galleries in Sydney, you know. I can't wait for when the voice is in there so we can have some stronger laws to get those elders out of that space, to get those carpetbaggers shut down because the only way we can do that right now is commercial law because and contract law and because there's so many arts organisations and industry people that know about it and tiptoe around it because it is that Aboriginality stuff can sometimes be a little bit too difficult. Oh, it's Aboriginal politics. We can't <laughs> interfere too much. The community has to do it. Have a backbone. Lean in. Have that conversation. We are bringing so much to this country. Our money, the money that is made off our products brings so much to this country, but they don't protect our intellectual property. We're constantly, well, your sister's now biggest intellectual property lawyer. She's not that famous. <laughs> <laughs> you know, protecting famous us. Family. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, you look at it and go, I, you know, I wish that Productivity Commission was stronger on carpetbaggers, and that's just a personal thing. But we need to look at it and go, how do we protect? Because we are the best part of this country. Like, let's be honest, our football stars in every code, our sports stars in every code, are the best, they make the grain gate. You know, our writers, our actors, they bring an element that is so superior to all the other ones. We know <laughs> we are the best. So, <laughs> but it's, we need to recognise that and also go, let us tell our truths, let us lean in these conversations and we know what we're doing and we do it well with the minimal amount that the government allows us to have. Imagine if we were able to lead from the start of a consultation process instead of at the end when we have to work through a boundaries that it looks like a hexagon and we just want it in a bloody circle. Yeah, this well goes said, across. Sorry. Well said. <laughs> yeah. It goes across everything, right? You know, whether it's the justice system, because I was just seeing a report just uh, yesterday, I think, that again confirmed with the most incarcerated people on the planet that the, um, the rates of uh, incarceration uh, are at least twice that of, you know, um, African-American people in the United States. Um, just in the Northern Territory, uh, just recently, uh, a second child in three months died in care. Uh, you know, in the Northern Territory, almost all the time, it's 100% Indigenous children that are in detention. Um, and in the women's prison, uh, they've got women with disabilities being cared for by other um, persons that are in, in incarceration, not proper carers and all this sort of stuff. I mean, that's the justice system and the way that uh, all of that works. It's about all the common issues, you know, across our communities, about housing, crowded housing. It's about how funding uh, is spent in our communities, infrastructure. All of these things are decided thousands of kilometres away from our communities generally, you know, completely disconnected from us. And the establishment of a voice, the first element in the Uluru Statement, is absolutely vital to affecting the laws and policies that do all of that. Rolf, you know, who got away with what he got away with recently, it was the law that let him get away with that. And why can't we change the law so that that doesn't happen anymore, you know? It, it just affects so much. So I, I know we're coming close yeah. to time, brother, but I just wanted to say that, um, you know, we have, uh, Linda called it a, a once in a generation opportunity. I think it's a once in generations opportunity 
that we have late next year to encourage the rest of Australia to vote yes and to fundamentally change the structure of this country. And we all have to get behind it. And you guys have great skills in arts and performance and all of that. And that really does move people. And we've got to take that opportunity. Mm. All right, I might, we're close coming to the end, I might get uh, sort of com some concluding comments. Um, Thomas, and I'll start with you, Uncle, is the Minister Bernie said this morning that we do have a once in a generation moment here, and really this is an invitation to the nation. It's an invitation towards a referendum. There's work being done on treaties across the state and territories of Australia. There's funding now for a truth telling process. Let's look forward at 10 years. Let's look forward in a decade. Uncle, well, look, looking, looking forward 10 years, so 10 years yeah. looking back, with what, would, the, what would you hope to see that we've achieved as a nation? Looking, looking back, go forward 10 years and look back. What have we achieved? Have we achieved treaties? Do, yeah. do we have a voice? Do we have a truth telling? I think, I think a voice would be would be good at least that way we've got a we've got to say they know what we're talking about uh -huh. truth and that will come in later but the treaty we have to look at that because I've seen treaties because I, I, I lived in Canada for a while and I went there one day to a treaty celebrations and they got their treaty in 1899 and they was celebrating and there was this big truck there and this truck had a big box, like a big toolbox. And I was sitting there and I look and I was thinking, what's in them boxes? Because the government people came there, they opened the slide and the drawer up on the truck. They had all these blankets. And in this box they had all five brand new five dollar notes. I said, what, what's that for? They said, oh, our treaty says that every year when we have treaty day, they give us a brand new blanket and a brand new $5 note. That was written in the treaty in 1899. And they're still doing that today. You know, we, got a, we, 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 we should be saying, well, okay, what about inflation? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. All these things that we have to look at, if you're going to wait, all the time and they still doing the same thing you know I said the other day to a couple of people we're looking at all the stuff that people get the farmers the mining companies the builders uh, everything why don't we say to them okay and this is looking at with inflation added onto it too why don't you give five dollars a week out of your wages or whatever money you got coming in that builds up? You got to sell something in a month. You got five dollars a week or maybe more than that if you're a farmer. Would be worked out how much you could give to an Aboriginal bank account. There's 25 million people in this country. Everyone whether the government put it into tax or what, that comes into a bank account for Aboriginal people. Because look at all the farmers. They're living on our land. All the shopkeepers, they're living on our land. They're making a lot of money. All the miners. What about that diamond mine over in Western Australia? The pink diamond. That was a community before they discovered the diamonds and they kicked everyone off. They made billions of dollars. The people around there, I think they got maybe six or something Toyotas a year. So if we're going to look at something like doing that, why don't we say, well, okay, let's get built into the taxation, whatever. Not coming out of a person's pocket. Mm. It comes out in a, in a way that everything else get taken yeah. uh, taken away. But the other thing too, I lived in Canada and I worked in an Indian-run prison healing centre. I worked there for over twelve months. 
I come back here and try to set it up. This is 95, 96. I come back to try to set it up here. I try to talk to people about setting stuff up in different prisons here. And one fellow said to me, the, the, one of the superintendents, he said, you know, if I helped you, he said, I've got a mortgage to pay. I've got children to send to school. I've got a car I had to pay off. I was sitting in his office and he was adding all this up to me. He said, if I help you to keep all the Aboriginal people out of jail, I'd be out of a job. And I didn't know what to say. I, just, oh. I was angry, but we were sitting in the jail, so I had to bite my tongue. <laughs> I just walked out. I said, yeah, okay, see you later. So all these things, it's like they got the, they're in the driver's seat. We need to put Aboriginal people in them driver's seats. So those three elements of the Uluru Statement, truth-telling and yeah. treaty and the voice, will hopefully put us in the driving seat. I might just, we're coming up to afternoon tea time, so I might get concluding comments from Thomas and Sally. It's an invitation. The Uluru Statement, its opening words are, it's an invitation to the Australian people. What happens if that invitation is not accepted Joe. and is... The Uluru Statement becomes like the Barunga Statement, becomes like the Yirrkala Bark Petitions, and art is separated from our voice once again. Yeah, I was thinking about that when you asked that question to Uncle Moogie, looking forward 10 years, and I was going to say, um, if we were to fail, then I believe it'll be the status quo. You know, and that's, that's the reality. The cost of failure in the referendum next year is extremely high. Um, it'll set a new truth in this country that the people said no um, and that they want to continue ignorance. Um, it would set treaty back by decades and treaty is already predicted to take decades. Um, you only have to look at the most advanced process which is Victoria which is around 10 years now. Uh, no fault of, of either party, it's just hugely complex, you know, so long after first contact. Um, but without a national body to negotiate with the Commonwealth, because we're in a federal system, right? And the treaties at the moment are between states or territories and the First Nations peoples in those places. But it's like talking to a middle manager and we're not talking to the boss that actually can veto anything that we agree to. And the other thing Uncle Moogie might have experienced in Canada is that treaty isn't, um, you know, it's a constant battle to see what is promised in a treaty. Um, to see those things delivered, both legal, legal and political battles. So if we fail next year, um, then the cost is high and, um, and we must work hard, all of us, to make sure we win. Thanks, Thomas. Sally, I'll give you the last word. You're getting a bit itchy there, me mentioning it might fail. All of the chairs. Hey. <laughs> well, I, I think I have a little bit more of a hope for of Australians because I think this is the next thing into changing our country. And if it fails, then as just Thomas said, you know, it's a failure on all of us. Um, I mean, also you mentioned where would the, you know, separating the art from the politics. So cheeky me saying, you know, the dead hall of dead treaties, um, the Uluru Statement is never, ever, ever going into Parliament House in Canberra. Um, I'm, I've said this publicly for the past five years um, and as a presented person I get to have that right. Um, so it's actually going back to Mudijulu, it's going back to Uluru. That painting is going to sit in the heart of the nation so that Australian children can go to Canberra and see democracy there in that institution but they can also go at, to the heart of the nation and see what we did there. And it's also an invitation for other works um, that have shown that Aboriginal leadership to be in that space. So we'll have the document from the 1967, uh, the handback of um, the national parks and all of that sort of stuff. Um, but really, it's if we fail, then well, I'm not even thinking about if it's failing. I'm thinking that we. I have a little bit more of hope for the Australian people because there is so much more 
out there than just what was considered the status quo before. There is more and more multicultural community members in our countries. Um, and also the fact that it is a younger cohort that will lead that space. So this is a first time if you're under 42, I think it is, 42 and under, is that right, Thomas? Well, 44 and younger, then that you have an experience of referendum before. So it is our chance to change it. And also I think we can be a little bit braver. If it doesn't fail, let's get it up again. Look at Ireland. Ireland in three years went through three different referendums to get up some really difficult um, and controversial sort of laws in their very Christian sort of communities. But they got it up and they just weren't afraid. It's like 1901 was the constitution was done. Like, come on, let's update that. It's time. It's time. <laughs> Uncle Moody, do you want to... Yes, I just wanted to say... All the stuff we talked about is that it's with looking at the governments of today, if they'll make a decision, looking at the non-Aboriginal people, if they'll make a decision. Well, the governments for a start, I'm, I started up what they call the original Greens. And there's a few of us on there. There's a few of us in. There's a few, lot of people in Melbourne. That's with the Black Greens. All these right across the country. Why don't we all get together and still keep that strength amongst us? And then, because we know today, we know all about politics and all that. So, if we make a strong decision of how we're going to get that look after the country, look after this, get things going all around the country with the Greens. So if everyone want to join me with the original <laughs> Greens, come on. Yeah. All right. I know Bob will. I think, uh, <laughs> uh, we don't want a green voice, we don't want a red voice, we don't want a blue voice, we, we want, want a black, black voice. voice. Yeah. yeah, well, all right, what a great green. comment to finish on. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Sally Scales, Uncle Moody Sumner. And Thomas Mayer. That, that concludes our session. Of course, our panellists will be around now if you want to grab them for some conversation and comment. Uh, afternoon tea is being served. We'll be back here at, in about half an hour, just after 3.30. Thank you.